Hi folks, we'll give it just another minute before we officially get started, but welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's LF Networking webinar. Um, the title of our discussion today is Why Edge Computing Requires Cloud Native Thinking. And our speaker today is Bill Mulligan with Kubermatic. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, attendees will be muted during the presentation. However, we encourage uh, questions. There is a Q&A window um, at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to type in your question at any time during the presentation. And at the end, we do have some dedicated time to go over some live Q&A. All right, without further ado, um, I will kick it over to Bill. Thank you, Jill. And thanks everyone for joining today. So my name is Bill Mulligan, uh, and I work at Kubernetes. And we're a Kubernetes and cloud native software company. Uh, specifically, we focus on multi-cluster management for Kubernetes clusters. And the topic I'll be talking about today uh, is why edge computing requires cloud native thinking. So let's jump in. So edge computing is creating a new internet. And if you think about it, we're really kind of entering right now uh, the third act of the internet. If you can kind of think of it in three stages, it's really around how close is the actual application uh, to the actual user. So in kind of like the first stage, we had a really centralized uh, internet that was really focused around kind of like a, a couple main computing centers. And most of the information on the internet was pulled from really just a few locations around the world. Now, as businesses, uh, companies, uh, and organizations wanted to be able to improve their user experience, their performance, what they're able to do, we started to see the growth of regional points of presence or CDN networks uh, to really bring the application closer to the end user. So whether that's something like content uh, for streaming something and having lower latency um, or being able to host websites uh, closer to the end, actual end user, these additional like points of presence uh, would allow us to place applications a lot closer to the users. Now we expanded from, you know, a few hundred locations to a few thousand around the world. Now where we're actually going today is the internet that we need to build. And that's what we call edge computing. And this is where we're placing the application that we're trying to run as close to the end user as possible. And really what this is doing is creating a whole new way to make and consume technology. If we think about it, uh, it changes a couple of the fundamental paradigms that we've really thought about for the internet so far. So the first, instead of having really centralized uh, like cloud computing, edge computing is geographically distributed to not just hundreds, not even to thousands, not even to tens of thousands, but we can think of like hundreds of thousands or millions of locations around the world. Instead of having latency that uh, a human may notice uh, as you're like loading the website, we can get down to latencies that even machine wouldn't notice. So as we're working on machine to machine communication, uh, they can function in real time rather than having a latency built into this system. Now, um, the cloud, cloud computing is thinking thought about as a scalable resource where we can always rack additional servers, whereas edge computing is really out to like constrain devices as you're going towards millions or billions of devices, not every single one is completely scalable like the cloud. And the last part is really this going back to this numbers again, instead of thinking about thousands of locations, but thinking about billions of devices. So it's really a whole new internet that we're creating and thinking about today with edge computing. And this isn't just a small market opportunity. This is gonna be massive. They expect annual capital expenditure uh, for edge computing to be 146 billion with a 35% compounded annual growth rate. So this presents a massive market opportunity for lots of different suppliers, vendors, and companies to 
move into this whole new, like almost we would say blank vertical, that's anybody's game to capture. And so how do we actually define what edge computing is and think about it different than centralized cloud computing? And I'd kind of like to walk you through the different ways that we think of edge computing because it's not, edge computing isn't a specific uh, thing. It's more of a location and there's different layers to edge computing. Can you almost think about it like an onion as you're going out from the core, you're adding additional layers that are further and further away from these centralized data centers. So um, at the most um, least distributed and kind of like largest, largest uh, ways away, we have kind of these centralized data centers that may have be close to or really even are uh, internet exchange points, which then go out to the service provider edge where we have both uh, regional edges, which is uh, like point of presence or CDNs, uh, out to the access edge, um, which is something like central offices or uh, regional edge sites, um, to actual on-premise data centers, uh, where we're running things actually on our location, whether that be a shop floor, a hospital floor, a retail floor, it's actually on a customer premise to smart device edges, where we actually have IoT type devices um, that are actually doing the compute all the way out to the constrained device edge uh, that is really microcontroller based. And you can think about it as we move uh, from the right side of this diagram to the left, what we're actually doing is moving our actual device and our actual application from further away from the user to closer. So centralized data centers, maybe thousands of kilometers apart, will devices on the constrained device edge might actually be right in front of you. It might be a light bulb, it might be a handheld device. It is really right next to the actual end user. It could be just sensing the environment. So as we're moving uh, from right to left, what we're doing is bringing things closer and closer and minimizing the gap between what the application experience is experiencing and what the actual user is experiencing. And so this creates kind of like a whole new way uh, of thinking about this. And as we're going down this continuum, we need to think of all these as not, the edge isn't one heterogeneous thing like the cloud, but as we move further out in these layers, we need to think about what each of, what that transition through the layers actually means for the software, for the hardware, for the actual users. So if we think about it as we're kind of like going down this list here, as we're moving from right to left, what we're gonna see is increasing hardware and software customization, increase, increasing resource constraints, and smaller deployment scales. So centralized data centers, uh, once again, is running like almost like the cloud where you have very standardized compute like x86 servers or ARM. The, the software can be like off the shelf um, vendor software. You're not really that constrained uh, for devices and the deployment scale can be racks and racks of servers. As you're getting out to the regional edge or the access edge, what you're gonna be looking at it's still probably gonna be pretty standardized hardware and software that you're gonna be running, but it may be actually more specialized hardware uh, to start to accelerate um, what you're able to do. So the integration of something like uh, a GPU uh, on the hardware side or smart NICs, um, there's start gonna be having some resource constraints and smaller deployment scales. So regional edge or the access edge might be something to like uh, a couple racks to just a single rack to even just a half rack in some of the access edge. Um, so a, a much smaller deployment scale, even though it's still kind of like a standardized. So you can think of this uh, service provider edge as a, kind of like a, a shrunk down version of these centralized data centers. On-premise data centers are kind of an extension of that where you're gonna have uh, maybe like a full rack of servers or a half rack, it's still probably gonna be like x86 based, you're still gonna have pretty standardized hardware. Maybe you'll start getting into like some customized software um, and the resource constraints really co come into play here. As you only have like a half rack of server, what can you do with each one and how many applications can you actually host there? As we go to the smart device edge and the constrained device edge, this is where we really start to see the hardware and the software customization uh, come into play. Um, we have specialized uh, hardware that is single function on the constrained device edge. It might be microcontroller based where you have the software 
really just like flashed onto the device because it's only doing a single purpose and it can't really do much more than that. And the resource constraints really become a significant thing here. We can go down to a few hundred megabytes where every almost every single bit is important to the actual functionality of the software. So you're really concerned about the resource consumption here. Um, as you're going, thinking about who's actually owning this hardware and software and who's managing it, um, you can think of kind of the, the right side uh, of this continuum as more of shared resources. So X as a service, say it's infrastructure as a service or Kubernetes as a service or database as a service. Usually it's something that's owned and operated by a service provider, which is then rented out or lended out to the actual end user. Now, as we actually start to go move away from the service provider edge to the actual user edge, what we're going to see is actually the end users or companies or enterprises uh, owning and operating that actual like hardware and software stack. Sometimes this may be managed by the service provider through like customer premise equipment, but what we're actually seeing is the actual end user starting to own and control these devices. And as we think about the security uh, of these locations, uh, this whole first half uh, on the right here, as I was saying before, is like standardized uh, compute. It's like racks or half racks of servers. And these typically be into either traditional data centers or something like a modular data center that can be kind of placed on, on a customer premise or in these access edge sites. However, as we're moving out more towards the user edge, uh, these aren't gonna be in traditional secure data centers. So we need to, we need to think how we're gonna do security around uh, each of these uh, different locations. And as the next part is the latency, uh, as I was saying, as we're moving the actual application, closer to the actual end user, uh, we can change what the latency is and how the applications actually experience it. So moving to the service provider edge allows us to have latency sensitive applications where we're moving into the hundreds of milliseconds um, rather than uh, larger. But as we need to get to actual latency critical applications, we need something that's extremely close or really at the end user to be able to perform, to be able to provide the uh, latency that we need. So something like self-driving car, you can have hundreds of milliseconds of delays because by that time you've already run over the pedestrian or hit the bridge. Um, so you really need to think about what level of latency is really allowable by the application and where can we deploy it. And this last part um, is the actual software done it. Um, so on the constrained devices edge, we'll actually have embedded software right on the hardware where the hardware and software are almost married. Um, but as we're the rest of the devices, they're a little bit less resource constrained, we can actually see uh, increasing cloud native development practices. So something like um, running containers or cloud native network functions in, in the telco edge or deploying things based on Kubernetes uh, into these regional or on-premise data centers. And we're really seeing the acceleration of deployment of containers and Kubernetes into each of these edge locations. Now, as we're thinking about uh, what kind of applications we want to put on the edge, there's really like kind of five key vectors that we need to think about uh, when we think about why would we put things on the edge uh, rather than in the traditional data center. Um, so one is the uh, autonomy that it needs. So is it able to access the, the resources that it has or is it able to uh, call back to uh, different systems? How independent can it focus? If it's really reliant on things running in the cloud, it should be closer to the cloud. If it's really relying, relying on things sent to it by the actual end user, then it should be closer to the end user. So when we're thinking about uh, which layer of the edge should we place it, wh what does it actually need to rely on and how autonomous can the system be? The second part is the scalability. How big is our application? What kind of resource consumption does it actually have? How, where, how big of like servers do we need to have and how many need to be running for us to actually be able to do it? If we need 
multiple servers. This needs to be something that's closer uh, to the edge and more scaled up location. If it's running single purpose applications, it can be actually closer to the edge user because it's not consuming as many uh, uh, resources. The next part is the bandwidth. How much bandwidth does the application uh, actually require? The uplink and the downlink uh, when we're thinking about it. Something um, like uh, video processing uh, might need uh, a super high, <coughs> uh, like streaming video might need a, a super high uh, download speed while something like uh, video processing might need a super high uplink. Uh, so what kind of bandwidth do we actually need and what can we actually provide on each of these premises? Next part is the security and privacy. As we're moving from like modular data centers or traditional data centers out to this strained device edge where things are placed all around real physical locations, how can we make sure that they stay secure and how important is it to us, the users of our applications and the actual data that it's storing? Uh, there's a big difference between something like which dress did somebody buy versus uh, what protected health information did they actually have? and the level of security and privacy that we need to have for each of those. And the last part is the latency. How latency critical like, is the application? As we move further out towards the cloud and more spread out, uh, there's a higher latency induced between the end user and the application. Can it tolerate that? Or is it something that's uh, really like safety critical and running like in oil or mining, uh, oil and gas or the mining industry where latency isn't allowable because human lives are on the line. So what kind of latency does our application um, allow? And each of these things helps determine where exactly on the edge we should place our applications. Now, each of these vectors also come with really some, some challenges along with them. So on the autonomy side, um, as we're having more autonomous systems, we have reduced control over what they do. In a centralized data center, it's pretty easy to control everything because it's all running on the same set of servers or the, really the same server. As we're going out to more distributed locations, we need a scalable way to be able to maintain and manage those systems. Um, and the connection, the bandwidth, everything might not be there to have complete control all the time. Whereas if I connect to, let's say like, AWS or Google, I can be pretty assured that they will be online and accessible all the time. Um, the next part is the scalability. Uh, as we move further out towards the edge, we're really running into restricted resources, constrained devices. How big, how big does the application need to be? And how much resources can we like uh, truly provide to the application? This is key considerations. The next part is the uh, bandwidth uh, as we have limited connections what can we actually do with that uh, and still provide a good performance for the application um, as we're thinking about the security and privacy we're going to have risky locations that are accessible to anybody they're walking on the street if it's like a, a camera um, or accessible devices what happens when somebody can actually go in and just remove a server is that a huge security problem or security risk for us or is it uh, applications that are, are, aren't as sensitive and last part is latency. What kind of delays and disconnects uh, can our application have and what problems will this induce into the system? Now, this problem becomes, each of these challenges becomes even larger at the edge because the edge is a margins business. It's not you're selling one thing for a billion dollars, you're selling a billion things for one dollar. You're gonna have millions of locations and billions of devices and all this together, uh, each individual thing only has a small margin for error and for profit. So thinking about each of these challenges is super important as you're scaling out to the edge. Now, this is where I think we really need to have cloud native thinking and how cloud native thinking really makes edge computing, the business models uh, and their operational models really possible. And so if anybody's not familiar, uh, the definition of Cloud Native from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is cloud native technologies empower organizations to build and run scalable applications in modern dynamic environments such as public, private, and hybrid clouds, containers, service meshes, microservices, immutable infrastructure, and declarative APIs exemplify this approach. 
These techniques enable loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. Combined with robust automation, they allow engineers to make high impact changes frequently and predictably with minimal toil. Now that I've read through that, I'd like to highlight a couple of sections that I think are specifically applicable to the edge. The first is immutable infrastructure. The second is uh, declarative APIs. These two together, uh, a completely replaceable system where you declare the state of the world you want, want are, are super important as we go to the edge. Next are systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. As we're scaling out, we need to have resiliency, uh, manageability, and observability built into our systems. Last part, this is really key, as you're running at scale, living on billions of devices, you need to have robust automation uh, built into these systems. Now to kind of break it down and to line it up with each of the challenges that we've been talking about before, um, I'll dive into each of these. So if you really think about what does cloud native thinking provide for edge computing, when we're talking about the aspect uh, of reduced control, uh, where there may be uh, intermittent connections, um, we, can, we, we can tie that to the concept of manageable immutable infrastructure where we can uh, specify how things should be. And if anything goes wrong, we can completely replace it and it's completely immutable. For restricted uh, resources, what cloud native thinking allows us to do is that there is a cloud somewhere. Uh, it may not be um, right at the actual application, but what things can we offload to the cloud? The, uh, instead of thinking everything has to run on the edge, there's also things that can be connected to the cloud. Uh, we can run the cloud in multiple different places. And if we have a consistent thinking as we go from the cloud to the core all the way out to the edge, uh, consistent tool and consistent workflows, it allows us to place applications and resources uh, at the right location so we can uh, make the most of our restricted resources. Next part for limited connectivity, what happens when so something goes wrong, uh, when connections break down, when we, we miss a message? Well, cloud native thinking provides us uh, with resilient systems that will retry, that will try to get to uh, a consistent state and the declarative APIs of a cloud native system allow us to do this. We can declare our state of the world. And even if there is a slow connection, a bad connection, we will be resilient in trying to get to the desired the declarative state of the world. Uh, when we have risky locations and devices, we needed an observable system so we can understand when anything is going wrong in those systems or when it's been hacked, when it's been or otherwise compromised. In terms of delays and disconnects, we need robust automation. So rather than having to sit around and have one person wait for the classic IT, let's turn it off and turn it back on again. When these delays and disconnects happens, we need robust automation that does this for us, that allows us to really scale our operations through software rather than through people. And that's what cloud native thinking brings us for edge computing. So kind of like in summary, if we apply, uh, cloud native thinking to the edge, it brings a couple things. Is the standardized declarative APIs with immutable infrastructure, uh, with automation and resiliency built in. What this really allows us to do is to scale our whole operations and our business model, which is really a margins driven business through software rather than people. And this really makes the edge uh, as a concept and as a um, business feasible through a reduced total cost of ownership, higher resiliency and faster time to recovery and a faster time to market for each of these. Now, the way we at Kubernetes like to look at this in terms of cloud native thinking is actually the same way we think about the levels of automation for self-driving cars. So level zero is me in my high school parking lot, uh, learning how to drive a stick shift car, uh, grinding the gears, making a lot of manual errors, uh, unforced errors. And level five is your Tesla self-driving car. You just hop in, tell it where you want it to go, and it takes care of the rest. The system can perform all, like, all the tasks it needs to under any condition without human intervention, but human can still watch over it. And the problem with a lot of IT systems right now that we see at Kubernetes is that they're at level one or level two of automation. They have 
scripts uh, built around it. But what cloud native technology uh, really helps us unlock is level three, level four, and level five, where the system is running by itself and can automate a lot of the manual processes that we need to do. And this is really the largest benefit of cloud native thinking that edge computing needs to have to function as a business and an operational model. And so now to tie that into a specific use case and to be able to have all the buzzwords of the day on one slide, I'm gonna be talking about 5G, edge computing and cloud native altogether. So if we dive into uh, cloud, uh, 5G, uh, we'll actually see, uh, this has been a hot topic in the industry uh, for quite a while. Once again, you have you know, the classic hockey stick graph of what 5G will unlock for in different uh, industries like media, agriculture, construction, energy, manufacturing, but really what 5G unlocks for us is a lot greater capacities for our communications technologies. So faster speeds, higher, um, higher number of devices, more efficient network sli slicing, and this allows us to both connect remote campuses in things like oil, mining, gas, manufacturing, or remote healthcare in traditional uh, business verticals. But on the other side, it also unlocks a whole, whole set of new business opportunities and business verticals, including IoT and edge computing, uh, AR and VR, autonomous driving, smart cities, and industry 4.0. And so it's transforming old industries and creating whole new ones. And this is why 5G has been tied to so many exciting new uh, technologies. But on the flip side, it also has some challenges. 5G requires five to 10 times more base stations to be able to operate. These base stations are out in remote environments. They need to have dynamic uh, provisioning um, to handle this network slicing um, and higher number of devices. It needs to have a global data experience. Uh, as we're moving from cell to cell tower, how does it still recognize that Bill Mulligan is Bill Mulligan and should be able to access these networks? And how do we deal with the security risks? Like even as we're seeing right now, people are burning down supposedly 5G towers. They're out in risky locations. Um, it also requires uh, hardware acceleration for network slicing. So we're starting to see the integration of GPUs uh, into the actual network to help accelerate the throughput um, of our packets to the network. The integration of cloud native network functions. So a whole new deployment models that must be integrated into um, the legacy environment. So many telcos today still have physical network functions, they have virtualized network functions, and now they have cloud native network functions. Each of these need to be able to integrate with each other to ensure full operability. So 5G is not a magic technology that will solve everything, but it actually comes with a whole new set of requirements and challenges beyond the traditional teleco telecommunications technologies. But if we think about this in a cloud native way in the same way that we do for edge computing, uh, if we have five to 10 times more location, uh, once again, this manageable immutable infrastructure allows us to uh, scale out uh, our operations. For uh, if we need hardware acceleration, edge computing and cloud native thinking allows us to do local processing uh, of that data. In terms of integrating into and with uh, legacy equipment, uh, network functions, and operation styles. The great thing about cloud native thinking is that has declarative APIs with clear contracts about how it integrates into a system and how other systems can integrate into it. Cloud native um, network functions are a new like kind of operational paradigm and new way to run, run networks. And how can we make sure that they're running correctly is, we, is if we have an observable system. And the final part is uh, 10 times more, more locations. Uh, it, this robust automation uh, really helps um, us deal with these problems at scale. If you want to get involved in any of these opportunities, including uh, edge computing, uh, 5G, or really cloud native thinking, there's a lot of great uh, open source uh, communities to get involved in. Uh, so this webinar uh, today was brought to you by the great people at LF Networking. Uh, so thanks to Jill and Brandon for helping setting this up. Um, LF Edge is also setting up a lot of uh, great technologies to run uh, unified um, edge technologies. 
Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, it obviously hosts Kubernetes and all the associated technologies with it. And finally, the last one is CNTT, uh, which is the Cloud Infrastructure Teleco Task Force that's defining how to run uh, cloud, cloud technologies in telco environments. I'm actually the workstream lead for the reference conformance workstream based on Kubernetes. So if you want to join me, uh, we meet every single Thursday at 1600 UTC time. Please feel free to message me if you'd like to join and help out and change how we do networking in telcos and unlock all these great new business opportunities. So uh, with that, uh, any questions that anyone has, uh, this is my Twitter handle and it's my email. Please feel free to contact me before or after any point if you have any questions. So thank you for joining today. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, we just have a couple of questions that uh, we can go over and if there are any more that pop up, please just use the Q&A window at the bottom. Um, so first question, how is Kubernetes specifically working with the larger LFN community on cloud native network functions? Yeah, um, so there's uh, quite a few ways that we're doing that. Uh, so as I said before, I'm actually heavily involved in CNTT, uh, which is a sub-project of LF uh, networking to define how we should run uh, different cloud technologies, in my case, specifically Kubernetes uh, in telco environments. And the reference conformance workstream ensures that uh, each uh, implementation or each uh, from a vendor is compatible with the requirements set out by it. Um, so Kubernetes as a company is heavily invested in open source. Uh, all of our software products um, are open source. Um, we're at, we were actually the top five committer to the Kubernetes project uh, last year. And so everything, really the whole focus of our company is making sure that the open source community is as strong and successful as possible. Great, thank you. Um, sort of a related question, how does participation in open source initiatives help companies in general progress with their networking and edge solutions? Yeah, so I think we can really see this in both the success of Linux and in Kubernetes, uh, probably the two most well-known like open source technologies. What participating in these communities uh, allows uh, actual companies to do is one to uh, leverage the um, like the the power of open source um, is really having the best technology solutions um, available on the market to be able to deploy uh, and manage their applications in terms of and then in terms of like actually contributing what that gives them it gives them a voice in the community now there's multiple different ways to get involved in community uh, a lot of people think the only way that counts is uh, writing code, but actually uh, I contribute to open source without writing any code. Uh, so actually I would not consider myself a coder at all. Um, and I, I still contribute to open source in a variety of different ways. And one is with CNTT giving us a voice um, in the telco world and making other companies aware uh, of what we do. Another is through the CNCF. They just launched uh, an end user uh, tech radar of that lets companies say what they're actually using in testing or production for different technologies. The first one they launched was um, actually around uh, CICD and which, what, what companies are actually using. And this knowledge uh, gives other companies uh, insight into what is that actually like the best practices in the field. Uh, so there's actually multiple ways for companies to contribute uh, and to uh, enjoy the benefits of open source technologies. Great, thank you. Um, just a couple more questions. What are some trends you're seeing as cloud native functions, cloud native network functions, CNS become more pervasive across the telco edge? So uh, a, a couple trends that, we're, that I'm definitely seeing right now. Um, <clears throat> the biggest one is that uh, Kubernetes is definitely coming onto the scene. Uh, so we're a vendor of a multi-cluster solution and we've been included in multiple RFIs now of vendors looking to use Kubernetes to um, deploy their uh, cloud native network functions. I think that's really the biggest thing is we're really switching away from a virtualized world into 
a containerized world. And I would say that's a massive kind of like mindset and operational change. And that's really the trend I'm most excited about because it really creates a whole new paradigm of what you're able to do uh, with technology. Um, and then the other trend I'm, I guess I would say I, I'm pretty excited about is really kind of the telcos like getting behind um, open source. I think a lot of the work that we're doing uh, in CMTT is really exciting to see kind of like the whole industry coming together to really define what the best practices are. I think that's really cool to see. Awesome. Um, it looks like we just have one more question here. Um, how do Kubernetes clusters run in constrained resources at the edge? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. And I have a blog post coming out uh, soon about that. And um, I think the way that people should look at it, uh, there's multiple different ways to look at it. One is trying to shrink down the Kubernetes cluster and making a fork of it and cutting things out. But we at Kubernetes don't actually believe that's the way to go because then you're actually running into the same problem you had before of having to run multiple different infrastructure stacks. So having to not, not just have one consistent stack all the way from the cloud to the core data center, all the way out to the edge. And what we actually think of how companies should think about it is they should redefine what an actual Kubernetes cluster is. Um, and what a Kubernetes cluster really is uh, for an end user, the only thing they care about is their application running. And the only thing that's running their application is the actual worker nodes. The control plane is actually irrelevant uh, to the actual application running. Yes, it matters in terms of the, like, the, the management, but once your application is running, you don't actually need the control plane for continue, continue to function. You won't be able to update it, but it will still be able to function. Um, so the actual functional unit of a Kubernetes cluster is really just the worker node with a kubelet. So as you're going out to the constrained device edge or um, you can actually redefine what a Kubernetes cluster is and all it really is, is a worker node with a kubelet on it. And if you can separate the concerns of the control plane and the actual like data plane, you know, like the classic, like do one thing and do it well, like the separation of concerns, um, you're actually able to shrink your like, what you think of as a Kubernetes cluster down to much smaller devices because instead of having to run a highly available like master setup uh, with the API server, the like controller manager, the etcd, and all those on the edge, you can actually abstract those out a layer. So this is what I was talking about before with the cloud connectivity is you can change where you deploy different things based on your actual resource constraints. So if your cluster is just a worker node running a kubelet and you can move your actual control plane up uh, a layer uh, uh, in the cloud, uh, that really unlocks where you can put Kubernetes. And so that's actually one of the things we're doing at Kubernetes is we have a multi-cluster management solution, uh, open source. It's Kubernetes, you can find it on GitHub. And what it allows you to do is to separate the control plane and the actual uh, worker nodes. And what that allows you to do is to basically place the control plane at a higher layer of the edge where resources are more available and have the actual worker nodes um, on the edge. And I think that's, uh, I think, a really exciting thing that's going to be uh, coming out pretty soon here. Very cool. Thank you. All right, so it looks like we don't have any more questions. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, the presentation, a recording of it will be available on demand starting tomorrow and everyone who registered will get a link to that in your email. Um, and thank you, Bill, for your time. This was really informative. We really appreciate uh, you chatting with us today. Yeah, thank you. All right, have a great day, everybody. Thanks again, bye-bye. Thanks for joining, bye.